The best time of the year is upon us. Football is back, MLB playoffs are just around the corner, and your favorite artists are out on tour. But did you know you can go to events like these for half off or more when you buy tickets last minute with Game Time? Game Time is the fastest growing ticketing app that guarantees the lowest price on tickets to all your favorite sports, concerts, and shows. You can see the view from your seat in the app, and checkout takes less than 30 seconds. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and redeem code DK20 for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's DK20 for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download Game Time. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. This is the Dan Lebator Show with the Stugats Podcast. No Ron McGill today. He is off tending to animal emergencies, but the football season, it feels like, is already upon us. And the reason it feels like this is because Greg Cody is (laughs) serving, finally, a grid of death punishment. He does not know what he was signing up for. We got a number of things to get to, okay? Mike Ryan, I'm sorry he's not here today. Soon he will eat three plies of toilet paper because football is upon us, and he thought LSU (laughs) was going to beat FSU. He keeps making dumb bets, and so now he will eat three plies of toilet paper. And now we will get on YouTube, sorry to the audio audience consuming this just by podcast, but we will get now the reveal of Greg Cody as Lil Nas X pregnant from... A photo shoot that Lil Nas X did. Chris Cody was saying he doesn't understand how his father is not more ashamed of his black toenail than he is of his pregnant shirtless belly. But let us get that reveal now for the audience in front of the green screen. I see him. I think the green screen was supposed to be filled with floral, uh, a floral arrangement. Uh, Does he have a microphone there, Greg? Uh, Greg has a microphone nearby. Uh, yes. How are you feeling right now? Uh, how, how do you feel? You've got uh, flowers that have butterflies in them. <laughs> he looks amazing. Uh, how, do, <laughs> how do you feel out there? It's tough at your age to be on your knees, is it not? Calling me Greg. I'm Little Nas XXL. <laughs> uh, is that a prosthetic stomach? I wish it were. Or is that real? <laughs> <laughs> if it's fake, it looks incredibly real. <laughs> it, 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 you think that's his actual I'm belly? I'm telling you, it it on, the, like on the screen, it looks yeah. like no, it. it. I actually know it isn't, but I, if anyone watching... <laughs> I don't know. No, if, that that's a prosthetic. It is a prosthetic. I don't know if you guys saw Brendan Fraser's making his return in the Darren Aronofsky. Darren Ar- Aronofsky is also making a bit of a return. The whale. Uh, he got like a six minute standing ovation. He wept, and it was like six hours a day of putting on fat people prosthetics so that he could be six hundred pounds. So he could play 600 pounds. It seems like an awful way to spend your day. Uh, Greg Cody just drank a bunch of Miller Lights, and we can't can't tell whether it's his his belly or a prosthetic. How do you feel in general, Greg? You have to spend the rest of the show like that. It is. You look lovely. Uh, You look. uh, Your accents are very nice. I feel lovely. Um, I'm happy to be doing this. It's, it's It's a wonderful grid of death punishment. I'm honored to be doing it. I'm a little big fan of Little Nas X and uh, Old Town Road and all that stuff. And uh, the flowers smell great. Be careful, by the way, for the uh, the podcast right. audience. Yes. You're right next to the pool. I just like I don't want you to fall in there. I know. I oh, oh, oh. yeah. I'm no. I'm being careful. <laughs> Um, he, he already fell off a boat today, today Dan. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right, bring him back in here now that we got the uh, the visual payoff of whatever it is that that was supposed to be. Put some shoes on, please. <laughs> and yes, put put <laughs> please put some shoes on. Stugatz, we're going to get to <laughs> watching him get up was funny. Well, just getting up. Yeah, from that position. <laughs> the act of getting up. Old man getting up. Yeah. <laughs> looks ridiculous. We are competing against get up with him just trying to get up. Trying to get up. <laughs> Did you guys see Mike Greenberg uh, after Russell Wilson signed for all that money? Uh, Lamar Jackson just wrote on Twitter with an emoji I S W E A, and you can imagine Dominique Fox Foxworth and uh, Marcus Spears how they uh, absorbed Mike Greenberg trying to do the. I swear of 
We're all just trying to figure out that acronym back here. Yeah, what is it? I had to write it out. So it's, I mean, it's not an acronym. It's just a word that you say. Uh, yeah, it's not an acronym. It's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's two Chris words. Cody Wombo. It's I swear, but there's no R in there, and so. Uh, but you can imagine. I you, swear. You can imagine Mike. Gre yes, that's how Mike Greenberg also uh -oh. uh, navigated <laughs> that particular minefield. Uh, Stugatz's dismissals are a SUI category. We are having our annual SUI category this week. Uh, we've got 11 categories, I should say. Our annual SUI competition where we just go over the whole last year. So that's going to be mixed up in the week that we're doing. And dismissals is going to be before noon today. Stug is it just Stugatz dismissals or is it all dismissals? So it's just Stugatz dismissals today. There is a whole separate category, which is the rest of the show dismissals. <laughs> I guess we've all learned at the knee of Stugatz how to properly dismiss. So there's a bunch of others. But today on the live show, you will hear Stugatz dismissals. Uh. I was very grateful, Stugatz, because something I didn't quite expect made an appearance to welcome in football. Much like Urban Meyer last year gave us what we've had for a while, I'd say 10 years college football has been, I'm going to root against Nick Saban. Yeah. I don't care necessarily about college football or any of the rivalries. I'm just going to tune in and root for Alabama to lose, and every weekend I'm going to lose. But last year, or last couple of years, we've gotten to be able to root in football on the weekend. For Urban Meyer losing, enjoying the misery of someone else losing, because in consensus we are together, whether we care about college football or not, I want to see that guy lose. And I was surprised to see it happen to Brian Kelly in game one. Mm -hmm. Game one, it's the Notre Dame stuff, and I guess that LSU has been good recently, but they weren't any good last year. But he becomes the face for these coaches go and grab more money, and now people are rooting against him. Well, I think it's a product of Urban no longer being there, so you have to find a second guy to not root for. Brian you Kelly. You no, you do. Okay. You have to have two. You need a pair. It's boring just rooting against Saban every week. But Saban has been alone in that regard for a long time. You don't actually need a pair. Brian Kelly, you don't get these very often. No. You do not get what Urban Meyer was doing. Urban Meyer, do you know how strong a hatred has to be for Urban Meyer losing to be a part of, to make its way into the storylines of Sunday in a way that Jacksonville hasn't been ever? Jacksonville doesn't get into the Sunday conversation. It was the hatred of Urban. I that, think people also root against Dabo, though. Am I am I wrong in saying that? That most people are rooting against Dabo Swinney? Correct. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's done some winning recently. Yes. But Brian Kelly entered the fray this weekend, and I was not expecting it. It's just all about public comments, right? And public incidents, I would suppose. I would suppose. Urban Meyer had so many last year, early in the season, and then... Brian Kelly has had a few. He's had the, you know, with the recruit on the podium doing the spinning thing. And he apparently had to go at Notre Dame by saying, now we have the resources to compete for a national championship. And the Notre Dame people were, were enjoying the fact that he had the resources to lose by an extra point on Sunday night. And then obviously, really, the, the coup de grace was the uh, fake accent that Brian Kelly had when he introduced himself as, you know, I'm Southern guy now. He just sort of gave off fake. He's given off fake the entire time that he's been at LSU, and so he very quickly became someone that was very easy to root against. He was already that, but he became even more easy to root against. Billy, we've been live for seven minutes, and you've been wrestling the KFC bucket the entire seven minutes. Like, what are you doing back KFC there? KFC bucket of death. <laughs> we got it coming up today. Greg has to go to the bucket. Yeah. Why? I'm already serving a sentence here. That was you last owe a season. Bunch of them. Oh, my, my wife, gosh. my wife, I just got a Steve Harvey suit mailed wow. to our house. My wife has been working. You've got eight punishments due from last season that you're going to be paying the entire Greg first, does? first two months of this season. Wow. Yes. That's cool. Whoa. Hang on. The baby's kicking. <laughs> wow. You know what? That's wow. That's both uncomfortable and thrilling at the same time. That's great. We're going to do what? funniest thing from the sports <laughs> weekend. We've got Stugatz's weekend observations. And Stugatz came in here with a take I had not heard over the course of the weekend. What's that? All I heard for Serena Williams was applause, fond, fond goodbye. Well, that's enough. I mean, seriously, Serena Williams, <laughs> if you look at the actual match, I think it was Thursday night. Is that right? And she played Tom Jonovich, I think, who's still alive playing in the quarterfinals today. Right. So has a chance to make it to the semifinals. But Serena, Dan, 
who is considered the greatest tennis player of all time, is up 5-3-30 love and then 4-0 in the second set and loses that match. And so we can't say it because it's her final major, her final tournament, but I'll say it. I don't care that everyone's showering her with praise. I do not care. Serena Williams on that night choked. And she will be haunted by that night for the remainder of her life unless she plays again. Because when you're up 5-3-30 love and you're up 4-0 in the second set, that match should have been over in an hour. She lost to someone, an inferior player, someone who's never made a semifinal or quarterfinal at a major tournament. Everyone wanted to see Serena advance, go through, make it to the semifinals, make it to the finals, win her final major. She didn't do it. Why? Because Serena Williams... Up 5-3, 30 love, and 4-0 in the second set. She choked. Now, she won that second set, and the best thing Tom Jonovich did was extend that second set to 7-6 to get into a tiebreaker, even though she lost because Serena is not in good enough shape anymore to last three sets. Oh, for the love of God. But then she got blown out in the third set. And so everyone's going, oh, that's Serena going out the way Serena should go out. Oh, she held off five, you know... Five match points. Give me a break. She was up 5-3-30 love 4-0 in the second set. Every other time Serena's been up 5-3-30 love 4-0 second set, she wins the match. She didn't do it in a big spot, U.S. Open, and people are afraid to call it as it is. She choked in that spot. I'm sorry. It was a big moment. The moment got away for her. She knows how badly, Dan, everyone wanted to see her in the semifinals and finals. She knew it. And she was thinking about it, and she was pressing, and she choked. And it's okay that she choked. She's the greatest champion we've ever seen. But in that moment, on that night, I don't care final match or not, she choked. She played she back gave to one back. Away. She played on a back to back. She played doubles the day before. That's her fault. That was a choice that she made. I mean, so her forty she years old. It was a God, unwise excuse choice. Me. She was scheduled. It may have been an unwise choice, but her and Venus chose to do that. They chose. She could have said no. She did not. Okay, so maybe she was tired the next night against Tom Jonovich. But when she's up 5-3, 30 love, 4-0, second set, she closes that out. She did not. She choked. She lost, to, uh, she lost to Rudy T. That's what happened? I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. She's very, very good. And I'm telling you, the best thing she did was extend that second set out to 7-6, even while losing that set, because Serena was gassed trying to win that second set. And she's not in, she's not in the same shape please as she used stop. to be. Just please stop. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with saying that. She's not by her own admission. I, I just want you to stop because what was a celebration and a coronation oh. and the way that athletes... Not have, the way she wants to go out, I promise you, Dan. The way that athletes age throughout time, the when they become 40 years old it's not that they can't still do it they can't do it as consistently you had her favored in all of her remaining matches because she won in the second round you thought she was going to win and you're now lambasting her the way no one's lambasting her because you thought she should be favored the rest of the way you wanted your feel good and now you're just hammering her when no one's saying she choked i wanted my feel good everyone wanted their feel good her box wanted their feel good you know the husband the coaches everyone Everyone wanted to see her advance because we love Serena Williams. But in that moment, Dan, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know what to you, call why, it. Why do you keep what saying else do you I, call it? But why why but, do you keep saying I'm but sorry? Why are we celebrating a loss? What are we doing? We're it's just a, appreciating it's, it's a, career. a great career. <laughs> it's a career. It's uh, gotta end eventually. Like it doesn't have to end with you yelling. Well, can choker. it end in a Grand Slam final with her winning? I mean, how about that? Dan, she was unranked. <laughs> She's an unranked opponent who's never made it to a Grand Slam quarterfinal. And to be up that much in tennis with that serve the way she was playing, I just couldn't believe she lost the but match. I, I'm just I'm I'm a terrible job. The thing that <laughs> The thing that I'm asking you... can't say it, I'm sorry. Well, you've said it, and you're brave in saying it. You really are. Hero Why? Heroic. What's going to happen? You're just heroic in choosing the moment that everyone is celebrating the amazing career of Serena Williams to get in one last take uh, on her, one last shot at the end. Just tell her she's a choker. The career was amazing. There's no questioning that. That match was a disaster. I mean, I'm sorry. It you, was. You quit apologizing when you keep saying. Well, I feel bad saying doing it. Was it. A disaster. I mean, I'm don't. sorry. No, you, I do, you, Roy. Don't. You didn't. I didn't to. want it to end that way. Uh, you are saying she choked. I'm sorry. Like you, you have. It, it doesn't. I, I, you're listen, I'm I sorry. Feel bad. I know what anything. I'm doing. I feel terrible doing no, this. We should be celebrating her, but. 
I have to call it as I see it, Dan. And that's what happened that night. She was up 5 3 4 oh, Close it out. Yes, you keep saying that. Uh, let's mean, do stuff. Am I wrong? Yes. Oh. Yes, you were wrong. Well, it's nice to know. I mean, <laughs> who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? Who is Dan Levitard? You watch so much tennis? I mean, give me your opinion. You just want to celebrate her career? 5 3 4 0. Oh. You didn't want to see Serena in the semifinals? You're not upset? You're not disappointed? Did she, she choke? She's just say it. No, she. What are you talking about? She's 40 years old and she came into the tournament. And she won majors last year. Almost 41. Yeah. I mean, what are you doing? She hasn't won a major since 2017. Oh. Like, athletes, are, last year. athletes are allowed to age. Feels like last year, pandemic, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. COVID. Yeah, yeah, that kind of helped. Yeah, yeah, when there were crowds in the stands. Right. It was a, it was a bad job. Great career, you, terrible match. You can I mean, say, who are you? You can say, who the hell are you to me on tennis? It's you an can. opinion. You can't say but, I'm wrong. Well, it's my you, opinion. But you feeling like you can come over to the greatest we've ever seen and criticize her last performance because you yourself are so excellent at your job at all times as you age. It's just an amazing criticism well, for you to file on, on somebody because you got to hit him one more time with choker. <laughs> because because you got to get you're that, on to me. You got to get that takeoff. <laughs> it one, was my last chance one, to call one, her a joke. One more time, and I, you're not going to get any more opportunities. She's going to deny you of them. Let's do stat of the day here with my. I'm not sure. certain she's retiring. By the way, that's yeah, not the way she wants to go. Out. Dan, I'm telling you, she might come back. In fact, I think she is going to come back and play just the majors. She said it. She alluded to it herself, Dan, when she said after the match, "Hey." If I only started preparing a little bit earlier, I probably could have won this thing, which leads me to believe she's going to prepare a little bit earlier and get ready for four majors next year. We have not seen the last of Serena Williams. I promise you. Mike sure has been here for all of this, just making faces. And he agrees. I don't think so. I'm sure he does. Uh, We'll get Uh, his. (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. Take no notes. That's my that's my contribution to this. Uh, We will get his other thoughts if he has any more after we get his stat of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, this is start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, and this is start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, and this is start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, and this is start of the day. The stat of the day is presented by Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter, the smartest way to hire. I don't know if you could hear me, but what I said was perfect take, no notes. Did you hear that? Yes, we yeah. did. Yes, yeah. we did. Okay. I just wanted to reiterate it then. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Since 2016, LeBron James has been paid $15,938 per minute. Steph Curry has been paid $22,137 per minute on the court. Udonis Haslam has been paid $36,187 per minute. (laughs) Heat and five, you cowards. You (laughs) did. I wanted to ask you, as someone who loves uh, loves entertainment and works in uh, in the entertainment field, Tom Cruise winning the box office this weekend. I think I read that Memorial Day and Labor Day, uh, last movie to do that was Jaws in or no Star Wars, Star Wars in 1977, and um, beyond that, he's also number one in the theater and number one at your you know in your home for what it is that you're consuming while this weekend doing a commercial in on an airplane for Mission Impossible in which he's doing stunts on an airplane he's approaching 60 years old are you like me did you think he was pretty close to done when he was jumping on Oprah's couch yeah I think everybody did um, for a number of reasons but uh, he has proven to be the most resilient movie star maybe ever. There's no precedent for him. You talk about aging gracefully. There's no precedent for anyone doing what he's doing. And it's also coincided with this time when movies generally have been less popular. COVID kind of killed the theatrical release, obviously. But that, even before that, it's been waning um, for decades now, across decades, you might say. And uh, I I thought he was. Everybody kind of thought he was done. Everybody thought like, oh, this is this is kind of the end. Um, and then the Mission Impossible franchise just kept just kept marching along. 
and he has proven to be the savviest, smartest, and most, you know, the the biggest box office draw maybe in history now. So it's incredible. I mean, that that thing that he did, I don't know if you've talked about it already, that whatever that was CinemaCon footage of him on that airplane, that's insane. That was insane. Like he is, he has this old timey carnival barker showmanship that nobody else has where he likes to do these things live and himself. And it it reads, like it reads to audiences that he's really do. sorry, he's really doing this. He's like in danger. He's like, there is there is legitimate fear for his life and that translates and i i just i'm utterly captivated by the guy i didn't really care about him you know when i was a kid i thought he was fine but as i've gotten older and like i like i got a i i had a, a spider bit my ankle over the weekend and i feel like i haven't been walking correctly for like 3 days and then you'd see Tom Cruise like sitting on an airplane, like just casually holding no, I'm not on. Sitting, standing <laughs> on an airplane. So for those who Sorry, don't know yes. what Mike Schur is talking about, he did a Mission Impossible <laughs> tease in which he's just standing on an airplane. He does his own stunts and eventually and, that- uh, importantly, it's an old timey biplane. It's like a it's like a plane from like the nineteen forties that he's flying on. And he's like sitting kind of sitting on the top of the like little seat that you sit in. But like holding on, like, yeah, like with one foot up as if he's just hanging out in the break room. And then at the end of and he does this like two minute long ad for the Mission Impossible movies. And then at the end, the plane banks really hard to its left. And he is basically uh, like lying down, holding on to this thing. I mean, he was, cl- he was strapped in somehow. I don't know how, but he was definitely strapped in. They wouldn't have done that if he hadn't been secured to the pipe lane. But it's bananas and it's thrilling and everything the guy does, I'm going to go see for the rest of the time he's making movies. <laughs> Have you noticed what Greg Cody looks like here on the screen in your... You can only see in a small... There we go. Okay. Yeah. Is I assume this is a bucket of death. Uh, yes, it's Lil Nas payment. X. No, just uh, a Tuesday. No, just him <laughs> really? coming in, enjoying himself. He My normal outfit. Uh, uh, by the way, Stugatz, on your Serena take, the place I will be able to go with you is that wow. Serena told uh, one of the... Gr- Greatest lies ever told in the emotion of the interview afterward when she said, if uh, if I can do it, anyone can. <laughs> no, that's, you're the only one. <laughs> you're, 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 you are the only one who could have done that. She blew it there, too. How about give some credit to the person who just beat you? I mean, she barely gave any credit to Tom Jonovich. She said she played slightly better than I did. No, she didn't. She played a lot better than you did, especially but in that it. third set. <laughs> By the way, Dan, the reason we know that she's the only one is there was another one of her who was also amazing, and she couldn't even do it. Like, yes, that's <laughs> Venus, right. Venus is like the fourth best tennis player of all time, and she couldn't do what Serena did. <laughs> Can I give you a bonus before I go? Can I give you a bonus Shohei Otani stat of the day? Okay, sure. Please. Let's uh, yes. play that. Let's play the sound again, please. Start of the day. Start of the day. It is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. (laughs) Shohei Otani. Of the Los Angeles Angels this season has six games where he has hit at least two home runs and nine games where he has struck out at least 10 guys. And no other player in the history of Major League Baseball has ever had at least six of those kinds of games in his career. (laughs) Not Babe Ruth, not Tungsten Armo Doyle of the 1921 Akron Groomsman. No one has ever done that in his career, and he's done it this season. There's no way to properly appreciate everything that's happening there with an anonymous franchise that nobody cares about that only loses, right? That you're no. you're getting these things. You care about baseball. You care about things that don't have a precedent. And this happening in the shadows must uh, sort of enrage you. It it. it certainly enrages me it'll all change either next year or the year after when he's on a different team i think um but his team is 20 games under 500 they're terrible and mike trout by the way also hit his 30th home run last night they both i think otani had two and trout hit his 30th and they can't win a game i mean they won last night they beat the tigers congrats they beat the tigers last night 
But yeah, they it's it's just so sad. He's the he if anyone is gonna make baseball more popular, it's him. And no one ever watches him play, and he's doing no, things that no one has ever done before, and it drives me crazy. He threw he started he had an at bat the other day where he I think he faced Clay Holmes of the Yankees, and Holmes threw like a ninety nine mile an hour sinker, and he looked up in the at bat. He looks up at the scoreboard after the pitch comes in and sees it and like reacts of like whoa, that was a ninety nine mile an hour sinker. And then in his last start, he threw a bunch of 99 mile an hour sinkers. And it's like, he's like a, he's the Terminator robot. He like learned, or like he's the Borg from Star Trek, the next generation. He like learned, he sees what everybody else can do. And then he just adopts their skills and then can do the same thing. <laughs> the pause, bananas. The podcast with Joe Posnanski and Mike Schur. If you want baseball information, there's plenty of it there, but it's also fun well beyond that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good talking to you. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. All right. Bye, everybody. See you, Mike. This episode is brought to you by the new podcast, Fast and Loose F1. Formula One drivers live life in the fast lane, both on and off the track. And Wondery's new podcast, Fast and Loose F1, hosted by Will Arnett, is here to cover it all. From McLaren to Ferrari to Mercedes, from Lewis Hamilton to Daniel Ricciardo, the world's most prestigious and fastest F1 teams challenge each other on the world stage. On Fast and Loose F1, you'll hear from the top drivers, managers, and team owners to get inside access into the high-stakes drama of the chase to win the greatest racing competition. Smartless co-host Will Arnett will be joined by two-time world champion, the flying fin, Mika Hakkinen, revealing the high-speed twists and turns after every F1 race. Listen to Fast and Loose F1 on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts or listen ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. What's up, everyone? 10 Day Tony here. You guys know I love staying active, whether it's hitting the gym, shooting hoops, or any other kind of sport. Even I have trouble with staying consistent. But I want to let you guys in on a little secret. Come here. Come closer. I know the gym intimidation, gym intimidation, shout out to Chris Cody, is a real thing. And it's tough to get over that when you're getting back in the swing of staying active. The most important thing is showing up and having a plan, which is why I love FitBot. It's the smart workout app that customizes an exercise program to my goals, equipment, and schedule. I could even do it in the shipping container if I had to. Some of my favorite things about the FitBot app is the user-friendly interface that takes me step-by-step on building a workout plan that's right for me. Their algorithm uses data and analytics to scientifically build your best next workout and maximize results. For personalized workouts that get tougher as you do, join me and download the FitBot app. FitBot works on your iOS and Android devices too. Get 25% off your subscription or try out the app for free when you sign up right now at fitbot.me slash Dan. Again, that's 25% off your subscription or try free right now at fitbot.me slash Dan. Don Lebertard. Chris, what was happening there? Can you please just explain to me? Just give the audience a glimpse into what's happening inside your soul as your father is uh, delivering clunker after clunker. It's just not surprising. He was texting me last night trying to get lines for it to make it funnier. And I was just like, I don't know if this one works. You're not really bringing anything to the conversation. It's just classic Greg Cody. Stugatz. Actually, uh, Christopher and I never had that conversation because I did reach out to him and got zero response. That's not true. That's, I can show you my text right now. I, I just did, I wasn't a fan of it. All right, show me that text. There are the Cody's t- tag teaming the show <laughs> to kill it. The Cody's as the crazy tag team duo, the show killers. This is the Don Lebatar show with the Stugatz. We're presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today and use code DAN for a special offer when you sign up. That's code DAN only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Two guys, I wanted to ask you if you were following at all the podcast war between I Am Athlete and The Pivot. Because coming into this podcast space, as many people have noticed the amount of money that's available You have podcasts flourishing all over the place, way too many. Uh, Very few of them actually get audience, but Brandon Marshall had, when he was doing the show with Fred Taylor and Channing Crowder, he had a certifiable hit on his hands, and then over money, as these things happen, that broke up. And in the year since, I've been surprised to see that Fred Taylor and Channing Crowder with Ryan Clark as Brandon Marshall has teamed up with Pac-Man Jones and Omar Kelly, 
the latest I Am Athlete podcast, you can hear Omar Kelly as a producer on that show uh, yelling at the group. They've got Joe Budden on who's saying he's he's having his time wasted by the way that they're talking about things. And you have Omar Kelly yelling, will you guys please talk about the pivot? Honestly, quit talking around it. Talk about the pivot. You've got within a year, I Am Athlete lost Channing Crowder over money, lost Fred Taylor over, mo over money. They teamed up with Ryan Clark, reportedly. Right. And now Brandon Marshall has Pac-Man Jones, and whatever has happened there, there's a legitimate, within a year, there's a legitimate competition between the two entities. And the reason I bring up Joe Budden is because he's found himself in a similar situation where his podcast blew up over whatever as soon as the pandemic started, where his popular teammates wanted more of of whatever it is that they wanted and then the next thing you know you have teams coming apart but have you been watching any of this because this has been there are a lot of people noticing a whole lot of people whether it's andre guadal at meadowlark or draymond green with colin cowherd that um, there are a lot of spaces for people to make more money away from games instead of with their bodies, they can use and leverage their clout to see if they can sure. create a business. Yeah. And I've been stunned to see the pivot get in the game that quickly with I Am Athlete. If you had asked me before, as soon as that happened, what kind of chance do Channing Crowder and Fred Taylor have to catch on somewhere else in a way that's equally meaningful, I would have guessed that they would not be able to. But they have, and they've done so with, with Ryan Clark. To answer your question, no, I have not been keeping track of it, but it's not surprising, is it, that you know duos and trios and podcasts are breaking up and feuding over, over money. It's like any other industry, right? And so that part of it is not really – and there's ego involved as well, right? Uh, that part of it is is not really surprising. Those two latching on and hooking up with Ryan Clark, I mean – doesn't surprise me that they have a successful podcast. I do wonder, Dan, because the market for podcasts is becoming very oversaturated very quickly. Like not when, becoming, it has it well, is it's already. Maybe, it's maybe we're there. Cheap, it's a very right. cheap way yes. for people to do all of their what they used to do in a different way to do it on demand on their schedule. But I do wonder if that feud is a good thing for both podcasts because they're both promoting each other. Right? Like that few that will get people interested in the I, podcast. Guys, I would not have been able to guess that I Am Athlete would have that legitimate a competitor within a year. I You are being unsurprised by that because you can't evidently be surprised by anything. You know everything that's going to happen in our industry. Well, no, Dan, I, I don't know this particular... I'll be honest with you. I don't know the podcast industry that well. I knew radio very, very well, but I'm not familiar. Like I'm not keeping but, track of Brandon what these guys Marshall, are doing. Brandon Marshall created a business that was supporting Fred Taylor and Channing Crowder, who were not national persons. Personalities. They became national personalities, at least in part because they were working through the fame of Brandon Marshall. And again and again, that podcast was leveraging its power to get major athletes to come and sit down with those guys. If you'd ask me, if you'd asked, I'm guessing, just about anybody listening to this, if Fred Taylor and Channing Crowder break away from Brandon Marshall, can they recreate something within a year that challenges Brandon Marshall, I would have been surprised by any entity being able to do that with Ryan Clark. I wouldn't have thought that anything. They for, clearly they've got resources. First of all, clearly right. they've got they've got because the making of content is expensive, and so they clearly got investors. But I would not have had the guess for you. I would have advised them not to leave that arrangement, even not knowing what the money is, because it would have been hard for them to recreate that with anybody else. Stay with Brandon Marshall. Stay with the known entity. I understand what you're saying, but. But if you told me, hey, they're leaving to go to Ryan Clark, I would say Ryan Clark's big enough, has a big enough personality where, yeah, they'll be fine and those guys can compete. I, I'm honestly most impressed by who's ever working behind the scenes there because a lot of people make very good content. A lot of people in the sports space and in the athlete space make very good content. But it's not seen by the number of people that see their work. I just looked up their YouTube channel. First off, on 534,000 subscribers, which is massively impressive, they've got 15 hour-long podcasts that are at least at a million views so the guests that they're getting which is important but also there's got to be someone who's like manning the youtube algorithm or is making you know visually appealing enough work that it's connecting with people their clips always go viral they have guests that uh say things and crowder says things all the time that are crazy and wild and they get aggregated on social media 
they've done a brilliant job. Because like you said, with the name power alone, like it's an alchemy that I'm always kind of fascinated by in our industry. How do you get that critical mass of people to care about a thing? It seems like every week they've got something, um, which not to be overly self-promotional, I do think Andre Iguodala is heading into that space because every week something that happens on his podcast ends up being aggregated in the blogosphere. I saw this past week uh, they were talking about uh, Jonathan Kaminga, the young player on the Golden State Warriors, and I guess Stephen A. Smith was having a go at his work ethic, and Andre Iguodala's response to that was out there in the press. Like, Andre's doing a great job of, of saying things and being in the headlines as a podcast about making interesting content. Billy, Stephen A. Smith, uh, have you have you told the audience how excited you are about uh, who informed you that Stephen A. Smith did not uh, reject the idea on Paul Feinbaum's show that he would run for president of the United States? <laughs> Witty told me. <laughs> Stephen A. might be running in 2024, guys. Wow. He did not reject it. He has turned first take and ESPN into his personal playground. He came in the other day on a helicopter with Jerry Jones into Dallas camp. He was on a boat the other day, uh, turning that into, uh, you know, just Stephen A. making an arrival. And now, Billy, you're excited about this? You would vote for Stephen A. Smith on well, the 2024 uh, that's ballot? that's the thing that I don't know, right? Because if I vote for Stephen A., and obviously everyone would vote for Stephen A., mm -hmm. and Stephen A. becomes president... Then what happens to first take? Exactly. Those are from the White House. You think he'd do it from the White House? Yeah, he'd do both. He would. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You think yeah. so? Yeah. Put it he'd on probably the have poll, to cut please. down an hour. He'd probably do 10 to 11 uh, instead of 10 to noon. Well, who are we putting in that slot? You know what I mean? Like, who fills that hour? Because I love J.J. Reddick, but if it's J.J. Reddick, I can't. You know what I mean? Put it an on extra the hour of J.J. can't. At Levitard Show, if Stephen A. Smith were elected president, would he continue to do first take <laughs> from the White House? How many of his responsibilities would he drop? Do you like? Well, he has a podcast that's going to start again soon. They, this is the so. reason. I podcast, wanted to bring this up. He's NBA got another studio. podcast. Does he still do the ESPN Plus show, Stephen A.'s World? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it got cut? Ooh. No, did it? Wow. What? I don't know. Maybe that's behind the scenes info, yeah. Dude. We don't well, know. Well, he's running to... for president, so right. he's, gearing he's got up for the exactly, run. Yeah, yeah, exactly something. right. Mm -hmm. He's got a new podcast out where he's going to talk about things outside of sports, uh -oh. things that you can't talk about at uh, Disney or ESPN, a place <laughs> to get off uh, his takes on politics and entertainment and other things. Is there a market for that? Is there a market as as this space gets flooded? I was making so much fun of Dominique Foxworth for the cover of his podcast, where he is uh, profiling. He uh, he is it's a sexy photo shoot on the cover of his <laughs> podcast. Uh, but Stephen A. Smith, you you guys have an appetite for that? Stephen A.'s opinion oh, on great. things outside of sports. You don't think he'd be good? I'm just imagining the debates. I mean, Molly obviously has to be the person that's running the debates, right? But who who is he running against? Like no, it's who's just he, him. It's just he's going to run circles talking. against no matter who he's debating. Correct. I would want to hear the first episode before I weigh in on that because I can't imagine him talking about anything other than you know being outraged at the New York Knicks and and things like that. What's he going to get outraged? How honest is, is he going to be about politics? That's my question. I mean, but do you need to be serious about politics to be president? Honestly, yeah, that's a good point. Like, can't yeah, we just run on a sports it. politics yeah. thing? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. just run on on r going against the Cowboys, the Knicks. What do we need politics? Who needs to involve politics with the presidency? Seriously. Right, Greg. Let's uh, let's talk about what it is you just brought up there with the New York Knicks because Stugatz. Yes, the Cavs are now a player than the in the East, and I felt like the Donovan Mitchell trade was less about the Cavs. And I, I do believe, like, they got good fast than it was about New York swinging and missing on Donovan Mitchell, having whatever it was. They didn't want to give up four unprotected. They only wanted to give up two unprotected. All the guys they've gotten rid of recently, including Julius Randle that they're talking about getting rid of, they have to staple assets in order to get rid of them, Stugatz. And you got the New York Knicks to be run by CAA. You gave this power to people who are not in the power broker. They're not in the basketball evaluation business because they were going to land you people like Donovan Mitchell. Do I have it wrong when I say that that trade was less about the Cavs? It was more about the Knicks not getting him, yes, and not being willing to give up the picks to get Donovan Mitchell. Um, it's... Like, listen, Dan, they signed R.J. Barrett. It's going to take a guy like R.J. Barrett, who's been very good his first three seasons, 
uh, for the Knicks to get back to being what those that fan base wants them to be. Meaning, he has to be good enough, and I think he will be, where superstars will want to go to New York and sign as free agents. I'm kind of okay with the Knicks not giving up all of those picks for Donovan Mitchell, who really, if he's your best guy, and he was Utah's best guy, what's that going to get you? A trip to the conference finals? Maybe. It's not going to get you an NBA champion. You have R.J. Barrett being a lot better than Donovan Mitchell? R.J. Barrett has a chance to be a really special player. He does. And his dad played for the Knicks, and he's a guy that wants to play his entire career there. So if he could pan out and be really, really good, good enough where other players want to play with him, then that's the only way. Because, Dan, players don't want to go there. You can have Whether it's the well, owner, whatever it is, players just sit. They've told you out loud, hey. Jalen Brunson, Brunson just went there. Well, and that's another. His dad played for the Knicks. like, But Kevin Durant didn't. He went to Brooklyn. Kyrie Irving didn't. He went to Brooklyn. Like the superstars, the best of the best players, they don't seem like they want to play for James Dolan. Didn't you get that management team because that's what they were going to do? What's the point of having that management team if what you're going to do is just leave the basketball evaluation of whether R.J. Barrett is going to be Donovan Mitchell to them? Like, you got them so they'd be able to get around the obstruction that is your owner. You got them because of relationships, not because... They, to got, mask the owner got, because of relationships. You've got sports agents... But also to be responsible, Dan. You've got sports agents running the Knicks. Their only qualification to run the Knicks is that they're good at the relationship business. The Knicks couldn't do it the legal way because they they got people who just wanted to play there, so they tried to do it with the loophole shortcut of, well, just hire the agency that represents all of these players and see if they can broker these deals for us. And that also has not worked. So now you're good with the Knicks being managed on basketball evaluation by people who are there because they're in the relationship business, not because they're in the evaluation of basketball players' business. I'm not good with the Knicks at all, to be honest with you. It's been a disaster the last two decades. I mean, they have been the laughing stock or one of the laughing stocks of the NBA, but you can't force Utah to trade Donovan Mitchell to the Knicks, even if you have the relationship. They're going to take the better deal. They took the better deal. I know, but they were in charge of the number of picks in the deal, and now the Cleveland Cavs of Garland and Mobley and Levert, and they traded their depth basically basically for Donovan Mitchell, and they're a good deal better now than the Knicks. And they're young, and now the Knicks are behind Cleveland by a good amount because you could not get Donovan Mitchell. What's the point of getting those people to run your franchise if what they're going to do is protect the picks? They're a good deal better than the Knicks. I agree with you. But are they a good deal better than Boston, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, the Heat, Toronto? Like, what does this really do for Cle- I'm okay with the Knicks passing on Donovan Mitchell. Like, what does it do for them? It makes the Cavaliers the seventh best team in the East. No, they're better than that. They're no, better than they're, that. They're, they're better than that. I, I, just gave, the I, I, I just gave you Heat, Celtics, Bucks, Sixers, Raptors. I, and the Nets. They're, they're, I, and as the a, Hawks. A as, as a Heat fan... I'm looking at Miami staying static in this offseason. I'm looking at Cleveland adding Donovan They've Mitchell. They've fallen behind. Like yeah. Cleveland, when they were healthy last year, like they had a calamity with health towards the end of the season. When they were healthy, they were four or five seed in the East. That's without Donovan Mitchell. So if they manage to make this fit, Evan Mobley is one of the most talented young players in the league. They have three all-stars on their team now, which is what you want. Like, And they're amassing talent. They still have a reasonable amount of depth. I do think, though, with the, with the Knicks, Dan... Um, it, it is worth noting, and I heard this, I believe it was on the Low Post, where Leon Rose, who's one of the main people who's in charge of the relationships in New York, was the agent for Carmelo Anthony when he forced his way out of Denver. They sent to, The Knicks sent too many picks to Denver and thus had nothing left to trade to add to the team with Carmelo Anthony. So I think they're trying to be somewhat judicious about how they spend their draft capital in order to go get superstars so they still have something left to build once a superstar gets there. The thing is that the market has gone so crazy that you don't get Donovan Mitchell if you don't give up the full freight of picks. And Danny Ainge is literally just looking at a spreadsheet saying... How many, unprotect- how many unprotected picks are you giving me? That's what I want. Not Players are almost irrelevant in the trading of superstars now. It's just about, can I potentially hook you in 2028 with your bad team so I can draft fourth? That's literally the entire calculus at this point for trading for superstars. But you want to mortgage everything to get Donovan Mitchell? I, I would not if I were the right. Knicks. I actually think the Knicks were, were prudent here in not going for it because, first off, I don't understand the fit of Brunson and Mitchell as a backcourt, how that's going to work either sharing the ball or defensively. 
So, and I don't think to your points, Dugats, that Donovan Mitchell turns them into, I think Cleveland has much more as a base to go and win games than the Knicks do. I think Cleveland has made a huge step forward here. It makes sense for them. I never thought it made sense for the Knicks. My my larger point on when you talk about organizations leading and having vision, my larger point is you can keep hoping that way, Stugatz, that the people in charge now are the correct ones on evaluation. Sure. But they are playing so far behind the game in this respect. Leon Rose used to be LeBron's agent. LeBron said, no, thank you. Don't need that. I'll get my own people. I'll be in charge of me. Don't need you. Right. And what does he do? He spins that out into, well, I'll just run the Knicks. And now we're behind. And how are the Knicks going to do it? Well, we got to build super teams. We're not going to get anybody, but we're going to get the guy who gets us people. Oops, he doesn't get us people. Now he's in charge of basketball ops, and he doesn't get us people. And so what I'm saying is you get spun around like that, you can make the argument on whether they should have or should not have mortgage future. But New York wants to be a star. God damn, did they celebrate that one victory over Atlanta in the streets in the playoffs, and they can't <laughs> win without stars. You can not win in that league without stars and can they get them period not comma can they save the picks for three years from now you're behind the game on vision and leadership at every turn you made it as a four seed and you told me you were ready you you celebrated in the streets as a four seed in the playoffs and then you immediately tumble back and now you're stapling assets to julius randall because nobody wants him that's not vision and leadership like how if if you're always reacting and never at the head of the charge on leading and the people in charge of you are just the people you got that were behind already because lebron changed everything that's how you fall into that quicksand we talked about before that isn't enough in the movies anymore because organizationally, like they can keep all the picks and hope in R.J. Barrett, but who's leading you? Yeah, but why can't they build through the draft? Why can't that be the vision? Because then like, you build an, organi- you you build an organization. No, I know that's that not why you got about drafting players. But I think those guys were brought in to get the best of the best superstars, not Donovan Mitchell. The right. hope was those guys could bring you Kyrie, Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, guys like that, and they failed there. So, I mean, I wouldn't give up. For Kevin Durant, I'd give up all the picks. I would, but they're not going to get Kevin Durant. Okay? Uh, Kevin Durant doesn't want to play there. He's already made that clear. I'm not doing it for Mitchell. I was happy they didn't do it for Mitchell. And as far as these guys go who are running the organization, Dan, it's the best guys we've had in charge of this organization in many, many years. I'm okay with it. Like, Wow, Donovan Mitchell's young, though. I mean, he not is really. the future. He's like 25, isn't he? No. I think he's like 27. Okay. He's in his prime. I mean, he's good for a few years. You don't worry about him. Look, if you're the Knicks, why are you worried about keeping a 2028 draft pick? If they make that trade for Donovan Mitchell, everybody in New York, everybody who's a Knicks fan is happy right now. That's something. You got to make it, it. Yes. I don't know. I <laughs> don't know where, if they're happy. It, where has it gotten them being prudent, quote unquote? Make no, a deal you, for a star. Greg, you're right. I, I, I'm not sure the Knicks are an organization that should be about prudence, but at the same time, you know, Isaiah Thomas tried to run that team in a go grab whatever's available way, and it didn't work. They've tried everything. So you can basically dunk on the Knicks for whatever they do. It's just that they're heading towards this season as maybe a play-in team if they turn things around, and that's not where they want to be. So you might as well just take the swing. By the way, Donovan Mitchell will turn 26 tomorrow. There you go. So I was right. I didn't think he was that young. That's my bad. Uh, For Cleveland, they've got like four all-star level talents under contract for the long term. Like this is actually... Sound crazy to say. That's All, the, that's credit the, credit to Dan Gilbert. I mean, that's the best they what? can do. I would not give credit to Dan Gilbert no. given the amount of uh, dysfunction and awful that you have to be, the incompetent you have to be for them to stumble into some of these picks. I remind you that they got Le- LeBron back only because they got Luol Dang as a final piece for a championship run at some point, and they just sort of mismanaged their way into some of these things. Who are these four All Stars? Are you putting Jared Allen in there? Like, what are you no, doing? I all stars, no, Garland I, Mobley. I, Jared Allen was an all star. Okay, so yeah, I think they. I, I'm not sure if Garland has been one yet, but he might be on his way to becoming one. I I think they have a really good team, and they've developed well, they've drafted well, and they've not gotten bailed out by LeBron. I actually sort of agree with them when they're like, "No, we don't want LeBron to come back because we kind of have a thing going here, and it'd be the first time they've built a thing in 30 years." 
When you go credit to Dan Gilbert, I, I really do want to evaluate this part of it for a second. Because Stu Gotts last year team. was doing credit to Jerry Jones and, and just saying flatly, Jerry Jones is good at player evaluation. Well, I mean, if Dak wouldn't have done a stupid-ass play, exactly. who knows where that season would have ended. He's good at drafting. But if you're in a position for 30 years, aren't you going to stumble into a few of them? Like, if you're <laughs> never, if you have no job jeopardy, if there's no actual actual consequences to your bad drafts after 30 years aren't you going to eventually get some good players like dan gilbert <laughs> not the jets a, 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 dan gilbert if you're <laughs> if you're bad for 20 years as dan gilbert has been aren't you eventually going to get some players because they reward you for being bad by giving you high draft picks i mean they had lebron yeah so they got Kyrie. well, well i mean well they had lebron <laughs> and for seven years they couldn't build around him like, think about how impossibly difficult that is. You had young LeBron, and you couldn't surround him with good players. So, I mean, that organization... And then they had three number one overall picks in four years. LeBron didn't know what heat culture was at the time, though, and winning right. culture. Right. So well, he couldn't take that, that next step. Back. It, it wasn't right. about that, 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 that was before yeah. the right. super team era that he helped introduce. That's right. Basketball was a lot. It was a lot easier to win then. If you look at like the teams that were at the top of the sport, they all scored eighty-five points a game. But there are stars, and then there are superstars, right? Like you have Donovan yes. Mitchell being a Kevin Durant, LeBron James, no. Giannis type player. No. no, I think Evan Mobley of, of those four is the player most likely to be that level. Okay, of so better fit for the Cavs than for the Knicks. To your point, yes, but yes, yes. I, I would say those Stukats. I would say. Donovan Mitchell would be the best player you've had this century. It's like him or Carmelo. It's this I century. I mean, Amari for a month and a half was the MVP. 